Welcome to the Popcorn Junkies. Say hello, Mum. Hiya. Okay, we're reviewing Oppenheimer. This is the much advertised, much lauded Barbenheim and all the rest of it. Yes. It's the story of uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, is it? Is that his name? J. Robert? Or is it Robert J. Oppenheimer? I can never remember what his full name is. Hang on, let me find out. I don't know, but the J. Uh, J. J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oh, J. Robert Oppenheimer. J. Robert. Um, it's directed by Christopher Nolan. It stars Killian Murphy. It also What's stars star? Robert Downey Jr., which I didn't realise until seeing the film quite how significant. He's, he's pretty much the, the second main... Second half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it also features Matt Damon in a very sort of amplified role. It has a whole host of other sort of luminaries, including Emily Blunt, uh, Florence Pugh, Josh Hartnett, Casey Affleck, Rami Malek. Oh, Josh Hartnett. Yes, I thought Josh Hartnett. That was good. who he was. This is the story of the atomic physicist um, uh, J. J. Robert Oppenheimer who say he didn't split the atom necessarily though his team kind of managed to develop the technology that would create the atomic bomb he he was instrumental in the Manhattan Project in creating the bomb or bombs that hit uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm -hmm. and so this is the story it's a biopic it's a yeah. biopic of and it's a biopic and so far as we go all the way back to him at college and all that kind of stuff I was surprised Mm -hmm. This is my sort of opening gambit. I was surprised by how much of a political film this was, rather than necessarily, obviously it's not sci-fi because it's in the real world, but I thought I was expecting scientific drama much more, which you get plenty of. You do. But it was, I'd say, much more a political thriller. I mean, did you know any of that stuff about him being in the Communist Party and all the stuff about No, him? no, no. I mean, you know... I, mean, I, I knew vaguely that he was, mm. or he was accused of it at some point. I didn't know whether it was before he made the bomb or after he mm. made the bomb. So what yeah. kind of a Christopher Nolan fan are you? Oh, give me some of his films. He did all the Dark Knight films. He did Interstellar. He did Memento. Um, he did Dunkirk. Did um, he did Tenet. Oh, that's uh, right. And that's one Inception. I'm just going to say, did he yeah. do Inception? I think he's brilliant. Yeah. He's Why? epic because he's not frightened to put epic. <laughs> there's no such word, but epic epicity. Epicity. On, on there should be a word on screen. He's not yeah. frightened to absolutely go. I was thinking whilst I was watching this, he's kind of drawn to existential epic. Yeah. He's he's interested in existential thoughts as dramatic vehicles. You know, if you think of Inception, if you think of Interstellar, you know, eco, you know, uh, you know, environmental cataclysm, space. He's in. He sort of intercepts time travel. If you think of the reverse time in Memento, and I find him a curious director to know where to position. He is, but I wouldn't describe him as a mainstream at all. No, but he, I mean, his films make big money. Oh yeah, because he throws everything that it is his considerable skill, mm. doesn't he? And his great casting at the screen. You know how everybody was waiting for Tenet and then what, no, nobody, because of the um, pandemic, nobody had seen a film, had they, at the cinema and then everybody went and nobody, everybody couldn't decide whether they were slightly disappointed, except for one or two set pieces. Yeah. They couldn't decide whether they were disappointed with the general thing of it. So this is based on a book called American Prometheus. I love the whole Prometheus thing. I love Prometheus, the you films. Always, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I love the quote that goes with Prometheus, which is shown at the beginning of this, which is the quote from, uh, I think it's, is it the Hindu scripture, uh, which says, now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. And you can understand why this is applicable and why it was kind of invoked by Oppenheimer, because of course he created the technology, the science, the atom and what have you, in order to be able to do well, he was responsible for making the world a very, very dangerous place. He was. Or he was his, he? He and his team. Or was he, Mum? I think what this film does quite in interestingly from the get-go, so it tells his life story, it tells the story, and it actually becomes a sort of, I think this is almost the origin story of the Cold War. Yeah. This film. It kind of gives us the kind of nuts and bolts of how atomic weaponry developed and was born, and then how that essentially put us at the start of the Cold War, which is kind of where this film ends, and and we are still living in the aftermath of that. We're still yeah. in this world now where, you know, nuclear proliferation, you know, you could argue that although it was used once or twice in, in the war with Japan, um, it hasn't actually been used again since, even though there's been the threat of it. So could it have been the thing, to quote Kenneth Branagh, that will stop other people from actually blowing each other up? Yeah, yeah. I, I often wondered why it was used twice, and they explain that in this film, yeah. don't they? So, right, going back to the beginning, what were you expecting from this? Killian Murphy, I have to say, right. in the sense that I find him, even writ large on a huge cinema screen, incredibly watchable. Yeah. He's got one of the most expressive faces. So he do it all with his eyes, Mum? Obviously, if it's called Oppenheimer, he would be pretty much leading it. I was shocked and surprised by how conventional I thought the film started. It, it started with quite... Uh, I felt I was getting... What was the name of the, the film with um, Eddie Redmayne, where he played 
uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking was it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Theory of everything. Theory of everything. I was getting those vibes at the beginning. I was really thrown at the beginning of this because we were getting lots of Killian Murphy wandering around sort of like all, all his colleges. It was a rapid montage of him moving through college uh, and essentially getting to, uh, and us moving through his career path from student to much vaunted and respected scientist. Yeah. And I was quite shocked by how conventional I found the front of the film. I was really surprised. I wasn't because I thought that, that he'd do something like that to give us the hugeness of what was coming later. Right. I mean, why not? Yeah. He didn't big himself up at all. He kept mm. on about the fact he wasn't that good a mathematician as other people. Yes. He wasn't as good at this, he wasn't as good at that. And he lent on other people and that was that riff was taken all the way through the through the film, wasn't yes. it? Yeah. Um, they were hugely important to all the other people in his team. But what you have at the beginning in the first sort of almost 15 to 20 minutes, you have this sort of abstract technique of fission and fusion and sort of you oh, know, which is shown on yeah, molecules and atoms flying around, which I thought was all right. I thought it was quite nice. It, was, it, it worked really well in the trailer. And, you know, this was clearly, and we had lots of shots of Killian Murphy looking quite moodily, I thought, out of the stars. And, you know, and then you cut to kind of, you know, molecules and neutrons sort of flying around and doing all, all their business. And also modernism, they put Picasso in there, did you notice? Well, I mean, it was all, the, the beginning of this film, I think I think it was quite ambitious what he was trying to yeah, do. Yeah, I, I Especially for what is essentially a mainstream film. Yeah. He was drawing the connection, which I think needs to be drawn between modernism in all art, because yeah, you had exactly. the wasteland in there, you had music, you, did, I think, you, you had Benjamin Britten, I think, yeah, and yeah. he had... Uh, as you rightly say, Picasso and all that kind of stuff. He stayed a long time at the Picasso. He did stay a long time. Yeah, yeah. And so this idea of fracturing and splitting and breaking up and fragmentation, which is a key part of modernist art and modernist yeah. expression. I suppose some people could criticise that and say it was almost too much, but I thought it was really Well, no, too... quite the opposite. I think he should have done more with it. I think, oh, I think within it, he had something really quite, quite sort of compelling and interesting. And so I thought it did a really good job of parking where he was at in this idea of science and science breaking the rules and breaking new boundaries. You know, science sat alongside the arts. This was a moment in history. Mm. And so it really gave us that sense that we were in a moment in history. Now, of course, this is all part uh, during World War II, at the beginning of World War II. And I thought what was really neat about the history of this was the idea that, you know, I came to it thinking Oppenheimer's an evil bastard who created the most awful piece of kit uh, that now means we can all kill each other. But of course, what this film goes to great lengths to show is we, he, America wasn't the only one chasing this technology. No. You know, it, Germany was heading there. Yeah. Uh, Russia already gets there. Yeah. You know, so it's curious that I think this film did quite a good job of showing us that if if, if it hadn't been Oppenheimer and his gang, oh, yes. someone else would have for done sure, it. For sure, for sure. And someone else could have done it and used it in a much more malicious way than than you could argue the the Americans did in Japan. So I liked all of that. I yeah. liked the idea that actually, and I, th I felt it could have gone into that a bit more because the other thing right at the beginning, this is what I want to get a sense of from you. Yeah. We were quite quickly introduced to this narrative of uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. being this sort of politician. He's wanting to get into government, he wants a cabinet place. Uh, and in order to get this cabinet place, he needs to kind of, he needs to get the vote of the house in order to be kind of elected. But he's he's been part of this atomic kind of community. He's worked yeah. with Oppenheimer. Uh, and essentially, he's wanting to kind of, we discover he's wanted to throw Oppenheimer to the walls, you know? Yeah, well, we don't discover that for a long time. No, we don't. And I didn't, I must admit at the beginning, I didn't know, the film's almost a film in two halves in that respect. But um, I didn't know what to make of Robert Downey Jr. I, I mean, think the film, I, I mean, you've used this comment a lot. And as I was watching it, I was thinking, I wonder if my mum's feeling what I'm feeling. I felt for the first 45 minutes, the rhythm this, of this film was diabolically bad. Did you? Diabolically bad. It yeah. didn't know how to pace itself it didn't know where to stay so we had a think about it we had a rapidly developing yeah conventional bio biopic of his youth, yeah. youth moving yeah. through college we then cut off to robert downey jr seeking to get a job yeah. where he's then telling someone else a backstory which we're then cutting back to another point in time, which isn't the point in time of him coming through. Yeah. And Did then, you find that complicated? Well, it was complicated. I could work it out, but it was incredible. I couldn't get into any rhythm. I felt every time no, I was settling into, uh, not even a scene, every time I was settling into a time frame, it, it, pulled us out and it tugged us away and you know and it was using this what did you think of the device of using right, right at the beginning the first time we see Robert Downey Jr it's always in black and white what did you think of the whole black and white versus colour thing I don't know except us I know that we were supposed to take it seriously I mean it was politics I suppose as opposed well, no, to no I mean what they've said in interviews this is a different perspective it's, yeah. more, it's meant to be more documentary yeah and which it was it was. But it felt superfluous. I felt it was there for the sake. It didn't add anything to it for me because then he, he even then also used a different colour palette for the same time jump to Robert Downey Jr. 
which would be a sort of slightly sepia toned kind of color. And, and that was even more confusing. So, so I think he had a lot more on the cutting room floor. I, I think that, Mark. And I think, I think that... he struggled with what he ended up putting in the film. Yeah. To massage it in and make it make it sort of streamlined. I, I, I'm going to be really honest. I found the first it was three hours long. I found mm. the first hour utterly insufferable. I thought this is bad. Whoa. I thought this is bad. Well, all right bad, then. Bad. I know what you're saying, and in some respects, I wouldn't disagree with you. But where I would, and it go, I go right back to my very first comment that I made you when you said what took you to see this film is what makes it not bad, bad, bad is Killian Murphy, because he literally takes us. And he's on. He's in every shot. Well, it's a big close-up. I mean, I like. I have to say, I like the cinematography is lovely, and and it uses IMAX. Yeah. In close-up, I love yeah. that. I mean, his no, face I thought it was shot. the fact that he was he was sort of leading us through all these branches of historical fact, political fact. Um, I mean, we've already mentioned it, but I like the fact that we were shown a sort of art modernism as well as. I mean, they it were placing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were placing it in their in their thing, and I think. I didn't find it insufferable. I found it quite interesting in the way I found that it so I found conventional. it. I felt, I felt like I was watching something I'd seen a million times before. Oh, okay. I went waiting for Eddie Redmayne on a bicycle or, or Benedict Cumberbatch from that other one, The Invention of Solitude. What was that one that he was the machine guy? Yeah. Um, I, I just, now, the other thing that made it really insufferable, oh my God, he cannot write for women. He oh, the cannot oh, direct, that's a whole different story. he cannot tell romantic stories. Now, Florence Pugh, that was it, was all, bad. it was shockingly bad. I thought, who, how, I wanted to just immediately talk to Florence Pugh's agents and said, I wanted to talk to Florence that, Pugh and say, why have you got your kit off? What the hell? You know, I think that, you know, more often than not, I find it really patronising to the performer. She would have made a decision on why that was right for her. But, but her nudity scenes and her sort of having sex with Robert Oppenheimer, and, and, you know, the connection with the Communist Party and all this kind of stuff. I thought it could have been that whole sort of milieu and that whole realm, I felt, could have been drawn in a much more nuanced, complex, clever, witty. I think it really um, suffered with bad script. Yeah, I absolutely agree script. with that. And considering it was almost like they'd got somebody that infuriated me. They'd got somebody of the calibre of Florence Pugh yes. thrown away in a scene where she's Giant sitting rating. without her top on. And you're thinking... What on earth but, is but he? But my mum, she's gyrating on him and then she oh, leaps no, no. up and goes to the shelf and says, oh, look at your books. No, I mean, no. it was so awful. I mean, I thought, I thought, um, what's the name of his wife? He Emily Blunt. I thought Emily Blunt was pretty bad, but Florence Pugh is Emily just thrown Blunt's. to the walls. Yeah, now, so this is not a criticism, a stress of Emily Blunt and Florence women, Pugh. Right. The way those characters were drawn and their relationship with Killian Murphy or Oppenheimer were both diabolical. They were, what, both of them. What? Emily Blunt? Yeah. What the fuck happened uh, there? It was awful. I mean, Emily Blunt got more, and somebody said this. I must she got have, better. She got better. She got better, and also somebody said because she'd done a film, she did a film with um, him, didn't she? The last oh, uh, yes, quiet. Yeah, yeah. Quiet. They said because she knew they knew each other better. It works better. Well, Killian Murphy's been in all his films. Kenneth Branagh's been in all. I mean, he, he often works with the same crew of cast. Yeah. And, you know. No, no. I thought he, his work. Well, it wasn't work with his female actresses. It was beyond awful. And another, and, and, and the reason I'm homing in on this, this, this is the first hour of the film. So, I mean, why so this not is just the, leave it out completely? I, I'm so pleased you said that because we're, a, we're already long. B, it didn't really add anything to the story. He's actually quite an unlikable. He's not. Yeah, he's not well, necessarily unlikable, but he's a very. Un, he's just not a warm character. No, which he showed well enough. I, mean, yeah. I always like that. I'm a big fan of characters in films that aren't warm mm -hmm. or aren't particularly likable. I like that. I, I mean, find that a challenge. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily want to like him. I want to admire him. I want to see him yeah. go through what he's going through. I want to see him struggle. I don't need to like him. I just want to know. Neither his relationship with Florence Pugh, but the, the relationship with Florence Pugh is about sort of hammering home. All that happens at the beginning of this film is we see his connections with left-wing politics and communism, which becomes a major issue, because really the Oppenheimer story is, is if you know the McCarthy trials, it's like that. America, yeah, essentially after the war, yeah. tries to cast him as a traitor, a communist sympathiser traitor. That's how they try to portray him. And this film, huge, huge parts of this film were actually the informal kind of, uh, what's it, committee or jury yeah. or yeah. investigation or trial, a sort of informal trial yeah. of Oppenheimer. So. If you're a Nolan fan and you're going to this film, which I was thinking this is going to be IMAX cinematic, in your face, explosions, bombs, atomic weaponry, even, I get it, you can't create explosions where there weren't any if it's history. Yeah. But lots of that sort of stuff, which the trailers sell you. Yes. I wasn't expecting to sit in a cupboard for approximately 40 minutes of the film. Now, yeah. that's not to say that those scenes weren't great, but they weren't brilliant. 
No, they weren't brilliant, that's true. Although the, <laughs> all those actors are good. They were all good, especially... Especially oh, the it? one who led, led him. Yeah, what's his like, name? Really I like really him, like him, him, yeah. I don't know him as well as you, but he's, he was really good, I thought. Let's get to where this film does work. What started to creep through for me, and I don't know if you agree, about 40, 50 minutes, but it wasn't loud enough as a sort of, almost like the thread of dynamite okay. started to kind of a little fuse lit, was at the point that you realise, okay, he's going to be asked to go and set up a town in New yeah. Mexico. I had no idea about that. No, it. and I thought well, that was really interesting. With And Matt Damon was going to be his chief of command. Now, before we get to Matt Damon, we have <laughs> one moment with Einstein. Oh, yes. Now... <laughs> I'm sorry. You're destroying my illusions. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Well, the, the, these are the problems that this, this is... Tom but Conti can't do any other accent well. He can't do Einstein. He can't do Einstein. He can't act very well. He can't Mark. act. Why did they choose him? And his hat, which blew off his head. I could see the string. No. No, I couldn't literally, but you could feel it. It was like, tug now, Beryl. No, that was No, ridiculous. I mean, it was... Anyway, so Tom Conti, all I was thinking of was him in... Why? in um, He's never in anything. He was in, what was it, Bridget Jones? Not Bridget Jones, what was the one? Shirley Valentine. All I could see was the Greek show, <laughs> you know, show, me a, show me a stretch mark. Yeah. I thought, and there's something about, because Einstein's face has become so ubiquitous yeah. and almost comic, yeah. when you see it, it's a bit like seeing Groucho Marx. Yeah. So I thought, that would, I don't know, even though it's what happened, yeah. all of these things were making me, were really holding me at arm's length, and then the fuse lit, and this is the moment where this film took off for me, with Matt Damon. Ah. Oh. It was the moment Matt Damon came into the equation and we got into what I think Christopher Nolan's most comfortable with, which is process, technical process, and humans moving through that, and the natural existential drama that was developing from this. That's true, but in one sense, I thought you were going to get to Matt Damon and say, and as for Matt Damon, he overacted dreadfully. Uh, no, oh, I didn't think that at was, all. No, no, but he, he did a bit. I didn't I thought I could, Whenever worked. Matt Damon walks on screen, I, I thought Casey Affleck was fucking oh, brilliant. Oh, no, no that, was a, that was a case in point where I thought, wow. whoever, whoever's cast this film, not the women, not the women who were... Cool. Well, no, the women were great. They, they, yeah, their no, script but, was, and their scenes were awful. But but the thing is, I don't think you should be allowed women no, in this film. It's a bit like, like, like they often say about Spielberg. Spielberg, or, Spielberg, Spielberg himself says, Spielberg, Spielberg has said, I will never do a sex scene because I can't do them. No, Atlanta Scorsese, I think. Scorsese yeah, is much happier not good at women, with, no. with men. So oh, Matt Damon, at the point that Matt oh, Damon yeah, kicked Matt. in. So I he think, was good. I thought he was excellent. Yeah, he was. I just thought he gave it what it needed. He gave, I mean, he literally, because Heft. of his character and historically what he did, he gave everyone, per everyone knew where they were at. He came into the lecture hall. The exchanges between him and Killian Murphy were really enjoyable. Yeah, they were. You know, military saw... versus science. Yeah. And they clearly liked each other. Yeah, and that's what I liked. There was a sort of mutual respect and there yeah. was a kind of, you know, sparring. And I thought he was very good at that. I thought the building, I thought we could have done with, ironically, I, I was expecting we were going to get a little bit more exploration of the existential consequences of quantum mechanics and what have you. I, I was surprised that he didn't go there because there was a really captivating moment where one of the risks or the worries that they've got around this scientific development, which I thought was a fascinating idea, was the fear when Killian and, and co realised that, you know, the Germans are racing to do this, the Russians are racing, then they're racing to do it. There's this idea that if you manage to split whatever atom it is they're splitting and you get this ignition, the danger is that there will be a chain reaction in every single yeah, atom. Yeah. So that so that the the globe will go. And I never knew there was that fear. No, I didn't. And either. I thought that was I thought, wow. Yeah. That should have been the point at which all the abstract fucking shots should have come in. Not right at the beginning. I didn't find this film took us deeper into his the dark, dark Promethean depths of conflict. As soon as we got through to the point that they've developed the technology and they're making the technology and they're testing the bombs, this film immediately went into the politics. I didn't feel we were going for the emotion. I thought we were going to get a deeply psychological, difficult, internal strike. I mean, he was that's not to say he wasn't playing that. He was playing that. He was playing that, but the film wasn't asking it of him. So he kept then walking from one moment where you think there's a lot going on in him. Yeah. To then another fucking committee room. Well, that's what that's what I would say about this film is that he is a god. I, they show that he's a god in one sense. The fact that he's the camera is on his face the whole time. You see every emotion. Mm. The fact that as the film goes on, he gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until you could see through him but because of the travails of being god mm. which let's face it i thought he was i thought 
Christopher Nolan was saying all that and the personality of Killian Murphy, who I thought played it brilliantly. I think Christopher Nolan knew he had a face and an actor. It certainly is face. Every time he cut to him, you cannot help but imbue that remarkable face, face with everything you want to imbue him yeah. with. Yeah. I actually think Christopher Nolan totally dropped the ball because he could i don't think he helped killian murphy out at all killian murphy did all the heavy lifting in this yeah. one and that's a weird thing to say because it's about killian murphy so you would expect him to but what i'm saying is is that every time we were so a small example was when there was a really powerful moment where he was i can't there were so many sort there were so many sort of lecture hall moments where he sort of I he's announcing sort of something those. and they're all bouncing their feet and, and then it starts to bleach out and burn out and we see one woman's skin start to flay as some kind of, you know... That's not until much further. No, that's much further in, no. But, I mean, it's only much further in that you're beginning to get a sense of the turmoil. Because what I thought was interesting is he he was up... There was no conflict at the beginning. There was no conflict no, no, because no. if they didn't do it, the Germans were going to do it. So everyone was just right. like, like doing it. The conflict did come later on. And, yeah. and that's why I'm homing in on this point. Yeah. And I thought, oh, here we go. Here we go. We're going to get into... He's realising the consequences. And, and it's going to go really fucking... It didn't go, it did not go anywhere near as deep as I thought it was going to go. It, it too quickly, after scenes of great existential significance, we were back in the broom cupboard. You know, he, spectacle, he's good at spectacle. He and, is, and he, yeah. We had some spectacle. Okay, okay. What did you feel of the whole sort of setting up the town and the building the bomb and the making of the bomb? I liked all of that. I thought all of that worked. As you're talking, it sort of makes me see the film differently in the sense that I think he was trying to do two things, completely different things. One is tell a story like, like this politically and keep us engaged in that. And the other one is show us the most incredible science fiction if you like, like he doesn't show it, he, but moments. I would argue he doesn't show us that either. He does in the end. He doesn't. But I, well, he shows us an explosion. There is archive footage. I this film felt strangely claustrophobic and unadventurous in its ability to show the magnitude and the monstrosity. I was fully expecting, and it's totally right to do it. Footage of the devastation, a moment of. This film really drops the ball when it, it doesn't even explore the significance of what the bomb ends up doing. They talk, I disagree they talk with that. about it. I disagree it. with that they completely about because it. it did for me in that moment where they're actually doing it and he start. I mean, because it takes him ages, him himself, uh, Oppenheimer, to realise what he's done yeah. to a full extent, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then when he does and they're all sort of pressing levers and buttons which are going to mean the end of the world or certainly the end of cities and we're given these flashes and i and that was so powerful i mean i instantly mm. you know cried in the sense of deep crying this is what it meant this is what they were doing mm. he's only just realized that mm. some things didn't work in that like the fact of go and put the washing in i mean that was ridiculous almost everything to do with women and his relationships with women didn't work, mm. but forget, and all his things to do with his relationships with men did, interestingly enough. Mm. Although a lot of the performances, I mean, a lot of people criticise. I thought right, I quite like Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, but I mean, a number of people have said they didn't like him. No, I thought he overdid it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, so he did all of this with his like. hands in the end, which made me think. You know, the way Fagan's always portrayed yes. in Oliver Twist, it's sort of like, I thought, will you stop that? I'll tell just... you what I thought was really good, some shout outs here. Alden Ehrenreich, who was his his assistant, who played Han Solo in Solo. I thought he was excellent. His little aide, the, the guy who was running around with him, telling him oh, how it's not yeah, going, no, and it wasn't was. going, and it is winning. I thought I thought he was particularly good. There's a moment where it's essentially Casey Affleck, who's kind of portrayed and built up as this really ruthless member of the American army, is interviewing Oppenheimer or chatting with Oppenheimer, and as we're unaware that they may be. I don't want to do a spot. Well, this is a spoiler review. Yeah. You know, they're recording something, and I thought Casey Affleck. He has like what two or three minutes in the film absolutely sensational that is so powerful such a powerful and, scene but then again didn't you think that partly that's to do with choice casting because yeah, they, yeah, before course. he'd said a word when the camera went on to him i thought i was suddenly petrified yeah that whatever he's going to do to oppenheimer it yeah. is going to be dreadful the script was really good when it when it didn't involve emotion emotional rela yeah. emotional relationships yeah the script can't do that much in terms of written dialogue in order to amplify Im deep emotional reservoirs of conflict you can't help but imbue, this is what I'm trying to say, you yeah. can't help but imbue Killian Murphy's astonishing face with all the heavy consequences of everything that's being plopped around him in, in terms of this film. 
But what I genuinely feel that Chris Nolan didn't do much more to make it more emotionally complex or challenging or, or, or de he, Killian Murphy wasn't helped by script. No, I, I, in actual fact, He wasn't helped so by his interrelationship with any other character other than Matt Damon. I thought, like, interestingly. Yeah, no, 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 I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, and I found the science versus military antagonism. Yeah. And then the moments where they found shared kind of destinations. And Matt Damon's really pragmatism as opposed to all this esoteric, you know, Absolutely whatever. No, right, I would agree yeah. with that entirely. I think um, they brought, I think their relationship brought a much needed... And in a weird way, although Robert Downey Jr. perhaps did over egg it, there was that nice other ancillary aspect to it. But again, I thought that was a that was another narrative line that I didn't need. I could have just done with a film that just focused on him developing the bomb, the technology, the constant self conflict, the potential implications, the little flicks out to the historic pragmatism that was at we work. I found fascinating. You know, yeah. so this idea that at, you know, it was a real shock to me at the moment where. He walks into that room where there's someone's teaching someone or yeah. lecturing someone. Hitler's dead. Yeah. And they haven't made the bomb or dropped the bomb. No. And you're I'm thinking, God, I didn't realise that was it was that late in the war that no, they did no, this to exactly. Japan. I love those sort of I mean, they weren't deviations from history. They were actual history, but they, he did those really well. I yeah, thought. I thought, and again, that's what I mean. I think where he was strongest with his script was he's i think he should have i think he should have stayed focused on one narrative timeline i really do yeah. i think this film got overly complicated i think I, as well that maybe sorry sorry to interrupt but no. i think he he sort of in a way i, I get what you're saying he felt i i saw it as a positive and you saw it in a way saw it as a negative he fell foul of the fact that in killian murphy's face we've got it's milton isn't it it's like a oh, fallen same, angel yeah, 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 so all much. the prometheus stuff and the thing of it we've got it on screen I without him doing anything some, that's my point i can look at the poster and give it all of that stuff yeah i was imaginatively putting into killian murphy's head all of the complications and contradictions and and, and horror that i would be feeling yeah. in, in his position and i was asking myself at one point i thought Christopher, what are you doing to make me feel? No, what, what's true. going on? What, what are you bringing to the table here? Because maybe, maybe the, the fact that he kept getting, because I mean, it was it was clearly obvious that he kept losing weight all the way through, mm. and that was, I suppose, maybe Killian Murphy took it into his own hands to show his sort of, you know, how well, bad he, he felt his about trauma it. His trauma was a trauma, literal manifestation literal, of weight. Because yeah, he became smaller and smaller yeah, yeah, and thinner and point. thinner, and. Um, I, I think, mean, thank fuck for, I mean, it sounds obvious, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, all the kind of pomp and ceremony around this film and Killian Murphy really, really is, it rescues it. I, I, I have to say, I thought the first hour was really, there were many, many, and not just the first hour, there were many moments, many moments, proclamatory moments, lots of monologues that were simply there to remind us and orientate us functionally as to where we were going and what was happening and i found that really quite tedious at times i just thought oh man and what did you think looking at it more deeply the whole idea of the town because it seemed to me that you know when they were sort of quizzing him and when they were sort of he was on trial effectively he certainly was on seemed like he was on trial to me they were more or less saying that he'd he'd let pe well if he hadn't done it himself people had come in and and spied on the mission mm. and informed the Russians. They say mm, that, don't mm, they? In fact, mm. well, we did discover that. Yeah, that was going on. That was yeah, espionage. I mean, what did you think of the whole idea? Of the, I had no idea that they built a town in no. the middle of nowhere. No, well, I kind of got a sense of it from the trailer, so it wasn't a surprise. But I mean, no, I, 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 I like. Yeah, again, I thought. I, I now keep sounding like a bro broken record. I think the better film, <laughs> not that I'm sitting here telling Chris Nolan at all how to make a better film, I think the better film, that town thing, which in, in and of itself is an incredible commitment yeah. and, and fact. And they pay reference to it at one point where he says, if you don't build a church, we won't get people to bring their families if you don't build a school. And I thought there were those little moments where I thought there is such a rich, complex tapestry of stuff going on here. He tried about, to do too much. About how, yeah, well, I think he, I think he might have done it all, but yeah. had to even get it down from a six-hour yeah. cut down to a three-hour cut. And I think in that six-hour cut will be all the stuff. I think, I, I think there was another moment with Florence Pugh, which I thought was beyond excruciating. Everything to do with her was it? The scene where where Emily Blunt sees her writhing in the in the in the room on his on his lap. What on earth? I know. Did I you mean, see that? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. She's looking at her. She's saying, then someone yeah. cut to a shot of her nakedly. Well, presumably that was some sort of surreal. Well, of course it was. But I mean, we haven't had any moment like that elsewhere. No. Rhythm and consistency 
is important. And so having this one moment of, let's call it magic realism, where Florence Pugh's writhing on him in the middle of yeah. this broom cupboard fucking, you know, jury situation. That ended um, up on the cutting room floor. It there was a terrible stuff. moment. I don't even think Florence Pugh looked convinced by oh, it. Oh, Florence Pugh looked like she was having Emily, a terrible time. And Emily Blunt looked rough. I mean, I know she was meant to because she was a drinker, but it didn't look like Emily Blunt. No, it times. didn't. It didn't. No, we can put, put the women over here. The women were truly dreadful. And I'd be furious if I was either one of them. What did you think about the stuff? I mean, I didn't feel I got enough detailed science. I could, no. I, I could have dealt with. It. I could have coped with. It. I'm not, I'm not a fan of physics. Who was it who said they're not? For, I'm, I'm not a fan of physics, but I could have done with a bit more. Yeah, that's interesting because I was just going to say, what did you think about the stuff? Which I find absolutely fascinating. Like one star bursts into another star, or it just makes everything disappear because it collapses. I mean, that is astonishingly I'm gonna, incredible. Am I, going, am I on my own in this? I didn't find that revelatory at all because I know it. Well, that, well, that, I that know stuff it, is kind of I've only got bog standard fucking physics. No, I know. But I it's thought amazing. we were going to get. I thought it was much richer when he was talking about you know one atom going off will ignite all. I was like, oh my god, they, of course they would have. Yeah, been that, a, that I thought, a, why haven't we ever thought about the potential ramifications of one igniting all the other? That I'd never thought about. No, no. I, well, that's yeah. No, and, I, I, and I think it also kind of dropped the ball around the whole debate around. Um, which we're living in now, which is this idea of, you know, with a nuclear weapon, is it actually the best deterrent? Does it end up becoming the best deterrent? You know, it, was it best that the Americans got there first, used it first, rather than the Germans did? Or that, you know, and I also loved a, lo a lovely historical detail, which I think is wonderful, is the suggestion that Hitler sh almost dropped the ball and didn't get there as quickly as he could because his expert scientist was Jewish. Yeah, I, like I wonder that. if that's true. I love the idea that his own fucking anti-Semitism yeah. tripped him up in the end. And it would have been actually his weakness. That would have been the thing that stopped him. I love the reference it's to Heisenberg, which is, goes back to... Uh, of course, of course it does. Breaking Bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It. A, I well, don't know. Another I cameo don't... that I was, I was quite shocked by, Gary Oldman playing Pre uh, President Truman. Was that Gary Oldman? That was Gary Oldman. I, as I watched it, I thought, I know this yeah, man yeah, yeah. is an act, a good actor. And was that, wasn't he horrible? Horrible. I yeah. thought, I thought you deserve everything you get, the American But there were little moments like when the door shut on Oppenheimer and he said, get that sort of snivelling, sort of wuss, uh, sissy out of the way. I thought, how do they know he said that? I don't remember. How that. do they know? Well, they say, get that crybaby out of here or something as the door shut. And I thought... I don't know, there were things in it that were, were really, really poor. Rubbish. Yeah, they were. And some of those were to <laughs> do with... Surprised. Some performances were amazing. And I kept thinking whoever did casting in this was absolutely spot on. Mm. Forget the women in this. But some of it was dreadful. Like, there was a particularly important man. He was in it all the way through it with his collar turned up and a big beefy face and a dreadful accent. Um, you seem to be the person who was let everything down in the end i mean i can't even remember what his name was he, he had a lot of screen time i don't know the face i don't know what he was saying it was i think, so... that might, I think you might be talking about ben safty yeah Benny, I, think, Benny safty. I think that might be him that might be i'll tell you who's in it the man who played um dot man in oh the... yeah D david da uh, damushian he, he, da he, yeah he keeps cropping up now That's doesn't it i don't know it, it see... must have been on the cutting room floor because sometimes when he when nolan wanted to present a, a, a historical figure and send us back in our seats. Like, I give you the Casey Affleck moment, which was astonishingly good. And I can't even think what they said to each other. Well, to no, what it. was clever about that was it, it was script. That was script. And this is what I mean. I think he's very good at kind of, you know, process and, and history, you know, the, the set piece. They would set him up as the most brutal bastard who he interrogated someone to such a point that there was no one came out of the interrogation. Yeah. Like, fucking hell, yeah. he's a fucking lunatic. Um, so he would say so he was he was soaked in kind of malevolence. Yeah. So when you saw this relatively friendly, nice looking American base. You became right there, petrified. He, you're like, yeah. Fucking hell, you're petrifying. Yeah. Um, OK, what am I trying to say? I think we have come to think that we're going to see a Christopher Nolan film. We're going to get big Hans zimmer -y kind of booms, big things, big moments, big events. And nothing could potentially be much bigger than an atomic bomb going off or being tested. And I was really shocked and surprised by how much of this film, uh, I think, got caught in a quagmire of political um, 
incidental political stuff that yes is of interest there was some that was interesting around global historical moment yeah and then there was other stuff which, which they made for a me, big deal of like the john f kennedy moment where yeah, 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 nice. thought, well, but the whole kind of mccarthyite type thing yes it's interesting but i could have uh, seen it so often and i could have coped with all of that mccarthyite he was not trusted he was then nearly tried and he was nearly cast as this traitor i could have done with that with a little title at the end just saying jay you know yeah. Oppenheimer. i'd have been like yeah. you're fucking joking after all that he was done that that's as much as it needed it didn't need another hour no, and also, I mean, to go back to Killian Murphy, when during that trial they put him up at the back on the side, and you don't get to see him, and as his face for me was the thing that was powering the whole yeah. the whole film. Yeah. It, 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 we got lost then in a sort of political wrangle, didn't we? Of yeah. what the, what the men were saying. I mean, I think what's happened. What will happen in terms of the receipt Having of this film that, is, I think a lot of people, a lot of film critics, you can't not say it's good because it's Christopher Nolan, it's Oppenheimer, it's Killian Murphy. You know, Killian Murphy's great, and Killian Murphy is fantastic. There's no, there's no taking away from it. He does, I think he'll be, if he doesn't get nominated for an Oscar, it's ridiculous. I mean, he, he gives it, he goes for it, he, he goes does. for it. I think he could have been much more supported with a, a slightly more nuanced kind of script and better drawn relationships between uh, with all the other characters other than Matt Damon. I mean, I, I sort yeah. of believed in that, in that a lot. Kenneth Branagh always dropped in as the kind of, I don't know. Even the, he wasn't. Well, the problem I have with things like little cameos from people like Kenneth Branagh is, you're spending a lot of time going, oh, that's Kenneth Branagh, which punctures the kind of immersion for me because you're getting in. And that's where casting can actually be a problem where you're you spend your yeah. time going, Who's, oh, it's him. And yeah, no, I agree that you that's You haven't really thought about what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, you know, little moments which just to me felt a bit cringe, like the injecting the apple with poison and then him standing there looking at it to get it. They, it wasn't that it wasn't a good idea or that it might have happened. It was just like it was done in such a sort of strange way, obvious way. It was done in a sort of um toy town way yeah toy town it was like yeah. by painting by numbers it was i was surprised i was surprised so if you're going to see a kind of whack you in the face from it well it really wasn't that for me i was i was sure. anyway why don't you give us your final thoughts and a okay score? well i suppose <laughs> this shows the difference between you and i is i wanted a film that told me a lot about the science and i felt i was given that and obviously you? you felt well i suppose the what whole idea were you told well the, i just i just adore the idea of stars collapsing into other st into whatever and taking whatever with no, them. No, 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 don't get me wrong. I mean, it's fantastic. but and I, and I know that will have been what he was thinking about at that time because we didn't know it all then. But yeah, it and feels I like the so abstraction sort of, of the images then. during those things. Mm. I loved, um, I thought Killian Murphy led us through the film and without him, it would have been boring. Yeah, it would have yeah. been great big chunks. Of I think a lot of people boring. will find it slow and boring then. I, I did think that myself. I didn't. Mm. I sort of, I wanted to go from one set piece with men all discussing I think a lot of people, for example, my, my test on that would be science. someone like Maddie, you know, someone in their early 20s yeah. is like, oh, I'm going to go and see the Chris Nolan. I really kind of hesitated because they want to do the double bill. And I was thinking, you're going to find all of the kind of American politic kind of committee room stuff really dull. Yeah. Really dull. Yeah. Dull. Yeah. Because it wasn't even done in a way that was kind of electric. No, it wasn't. Well, I was going to go much higher than this, but I would say 90 much higher than 90. You I was going to give me something like 98. Were you? I was. Because I was so, so... What, what got me was You've Killian got... Murphy's face, but also those odd, very odd moments where you, in the background you had people screaming and dissolving in front of you, which I thought... I thought the way that was done... Mm. That if it had been done any more obviously, it would have been it would have been cringe but the way that he did it reminded me again it reminded me of nope in the sense that it scared me to death but we weren't given anything really mm. i thought oh no sorry i was doing my summing up almost afterwards i thought matt damon was brilliant he sort of came in gung-ho mm. but i agree that his relationship with killian murphy if it wasn't for him i know, could have done with i couldn't have time i didn't i never tired of their exchanges no i didn't i didn't Whereas I couldn't care less about his exchanges with half his scientists. Well, no, that's true. And, and some of them were risible, like Albert Einstein. Guys, I mean, you, please share with me. You know, this isn't, this isn't, you know, I went into this, I was so, I was so excited about this film. I mean, I really was. And I, I do sometimes worry that that can be part of the problem sometimes. This is, I'd say, of all the Christopher Nolan films I've seen, I enjoyed this the least. Oh, wow. Um, it was held together by Killian it was held together by him in a big close-up so that's a good choice and decision by the director because yeah, you're going yeah. for your strength yeah I think what maybe happened here was whilst although you're talking about a bomb and I think I do think this film is is falling will fall for some people 
uh, will be a victim of what it promised in the trailers. And what yeah, it prom yeah. there wasn't even the sound of a Geiger counter in the film. And this sounds ridiculous, but from oh, a yes. Boise perspective, those trailers were all about ticking, talking, yes. Geiger counter. Don't get me wrong, that moment in this film is excellent and it's fantastic. And the, the moment of the explosion yeah. and then the kind of the, the delay before the aftermath of the, of the, of the explosion. He's saying, oh, that's great. But in a weird way, it, it I think what they might have discovered was, yes, there's a big bang. This is about a big bang moment. But the Big Bang wasn't Big Bang enough. No. Not in today's world of what we're used to. And, yeah. and that's where I think, as I was saying right at the beginning, he could have possibly done well to have maybe even... Gone longer. No. No, okay. Use CGI to make the fucking mushroom cloud a mushroom oh, cloud. I Just see. give us I something see. that makes us all go... Because I didn't even get that moment where I was expecting to be really emotionally moved at the point of... I was going to get an electric moment of, oh my God, yes, this is a seismic, literally, moment yeah. of... I didn't at all. Oh, I did. With, I didn't but only all. with those tiny, tiny little drops of... Um... There was some, there was a, a huge emotional contingent of this film was absent. It was really weird. There was something about it that wasn't there for me. And maybe it's partly because he was a scientist and an unlikable kind of character. And, yeah. And not warm. And, and, and perhaps he wasn't a very emotional person. But the whole film had a strangely sort of... Hands a, off. A sort of, yeah, unemotional aspect to right down to you know emily blunt unlikable florence Pugh. i didn't feel or yearn for anyone the only character i felt something for was the pragmatism the self-aware self-smiling yeah. pragmatism yeah. of matt damon that well was... now you say that and i sort of look at it as a whole i can see that i mean that was by far the richest yeah. if if the only relationship really that he had i think the middle for me the best part of the whole film is the middle hour yeah no i, I would say that for me too but um so if i was to score this wow i'd give this 65. Whoa, whoa, 65. whoa. I'm going to be honest, I was disappointed. Oh, okay. Mm. I I was excited. I loved it. Oh, well, that's good. We like, we like contrasting opinions. Yeah.